Martha Stewart Living, Travel and Leisure, Sports Illustrated, magazines you didn't order keep coming in the mail, and then all of a sudden, you get a bill. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're number six on the list of all debtors owing money to the state of Indiana. Angie Moreski with well, Jeff. Turn off. Just talk to me for a second. Hello, Mr. Would you spend $2 for an extended warranty on a $10 memory card? Don't do it. It's like throwing money away. Some of the documents that we showed you had large portions blacked out like this. That's another issue we encountered. The law allows judges to remove information they believe is not relevant to the child's death. Some decided to leave all the information, while others blacked out large portions, including the name of the victim, the perpetrator, even information in newspaper articles already public. It didn't have to end this way for Anthony, a child in an unmarked grave. This police affidavit describes the torture he and his sister suffered at the hands of a family the state should have known would not be safe. Endo made billions on Lytoderm by breaking the rules. Every taxpayer, every person in this country that pays taxes was harmed as a result of this activity. Why did you beat your child like that? Part of the answer could be in her CPS file. Prior history is often a major indicator of future abuse. But in the file provided, there are conflicting reports. It says no prior history, but then it says there's investigation under prior history, so we're not sure what to think. We asked top officials at the Division of Family and Children about the discrepancy. I don't blame you. That's, that's very confusing. I don't know what don't the hell. Like okay, you. okay, okay. I don't, turn it off. Don't you, like remember you. this man? He finally calmed down and talked to us. And it's like I'm some sort of a criminal running away. I haven't run away from anything. I don't know what this is. No one likes to talk taxes. Mr. Butts, okay. Angie Moreski with well, you can turn off. Just He's talk to me for a second. I don't wish We traveled all over Indiana and even to Florida to we talk to people the state says owe money, a lot of money. Most weren't happy to see us. Many live in nice homes and drive nice cars. They include a public official, a well-known car dealer, a former Colts player, and chief executive of a multi-million dollar company. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're number six on the list of all debtors owing money to the state of Indiana. Jerry Denny, chief executive of growing healthcare technology company Cinermed in Westfield, owes nearly $600,000 from a bill in the late 80s, but says he can't afford to pay. All this time you haven't made money to pay? No. Denny says his salary is just one dollar a year. He was, however, able to make two thousand dollars in political contributions to the National Republican Congressional Committee over the past two years. Come on, baby! Former Colts player Jeff Harrod made lots of money as a star defensive linebacker in the late 80s and 90s. Now he's been sacked with a fifty thousand dollar tax anything. bill owed since 1999. I don't know anything. Upon further review, Harrod's attorney called back to say he does owe the money from a former limousine business. Hello. Hi, Mr. Rachels. I'm Angie Moreski yeah, with Channel in. 13. How are you? Yeah, no oh, cameras, thanks. please. Alan Rachels is an accountant and public official on the Zionsville Planning Commission. Despite having a good job and nice house, he's owed back taxes for more than 15 years, recently nearly $80,000. Is there any comment that you can give us for the camera? No. Anything? Inside, Rachel's told me just recently he got on a payment plan, right about the time we started asking questions. More than 250 people, according to the state's website, have left their debt behind and moved on to sunny Florida. We came here to track down some of the biggest debtors, now enjoying the Sunshine State, to ask why they're not paying the Hoosier State. You saw his Easy with Wheezy car commercials on TV for years in Indiana. Now, Norman Wheezy lives in wealthy Boca Raton, a gated community with gorgeous tile roof homes on tree-lined streets. Despite all this, he owes Indiana more than $160,000 in back taxes. Oh, is Mr. Weezy here? An employee at his home said Mr. Weezy was there but couldn't talk with us. Instead, she let us talk to Mrs. Weezy um, on the phone. Do you think that um, he would want to pay that if he was aware of it? He is aware of it. 
he doesn't want to pay it. We found another on the list of former Hoosiers now in Florida, here in exclusive Palm Beach. The state says former restaurateur, 55-year-old Michael Rosenau, is in debt to Indiana for more than $150,000. Even so, it looks like he's doing okay. We caught up with Rosenau as he picked up a friend at Trump Tower where he used to live, a multi-million dollar condominium complex overlooking the water. Would you intend to pay that now that you know I'm about sorry, it? I'm sorry, I don't know anything about it. That's all handled by the corporation. Apparently, it wasn't handled. And what's worse, the state says Rosenau's debt is from sales tax, money collected from customers but never turned in. Don't you feel uh, an obligation to pay that to the people of Indiana? Excuse me. And with that, they were off to lunch. I don't know what don't the hell. Like okay, him. okay, okay. I don't, okay. Turn it off. Don't like Remember him. this man? He finally calmed down and talked to us. And it's like I'm some sort of a criminal running away. I haven't run away from anything. I don't know what this is. Tom Butts, formerly of Batesville, is now in the yacht business in Naples. He insists he also had no idea he owed Indiana money, more than thirty thousand dollars in back taxes. Until you came to the door tonight, I had no clue. Kathy Henninger is with the Indiana Department of Revenue. How likely is it that people on the in-debt list haven't been notified? Very, very unlikely. At the end of the day, she says, it's Hoosiers who pay their fair share who get stuck with the debt of those who don't. Now, the state considers only about half of the more than half a billion dollars in back taxes collectible. Tomorrow at 6 o'clock, we'll look at whether they're doing enough to go after these people. And, John, with all the talk of tax hikes and budget cuts, this could be a very underutilized resource, which is why the governor and the legislature are talking about a tax amnesty program. And it's not just income taxes here. It's taxes that businesses have collected and things like that. That's right. That's called a trust tax. You buy something and you pay sales tax or fuel tax. The businesses get that money and they're supposed to. They're trusted to turn it over to the state. But in many of these cases, they are keeping it. So it's literally like theft. Now, tomorrow, we're also going to take a closer look at why many of these folks never face criminal charges. And we're going to introduce you to the man at the very top of the list of delinquent taxpayers in Indiana. That should be interesting. All right. One after the other. We, people. They just kept coming. Ebony, and I don't, I don't read any of those magazines. At first, getting unsolicited magazines was just a nuisance and frustrating waste of time for David Moyers. I started calling the magazines to cancel. But they wouldn't stop, and then he got a bill. I'm positive, I'm positive I did not order those magazines. I was mad, I wrote to the Better Business Bureau, I sent a letter to the Attorney General. Getting a bunch of magazines in the mail is one thing, but the real problem comes when a company sends you a bill like this, falsely claiming that you subscribed and saying that you owe them money for something you didn't order. Thank you again for subscribing to Sports Illustrated. We're delighted that you are a part of the SI team. These are marketing solicitations trying to trick you into subscribing. The Better Business Bureau says don't be fooled. They cannot bill you for it. And if they actually bill you for it and send you dunning notices, that's actually against the law, according to the U.S. Postal Inspector. As for the merchandise? Just keep it. It's a free free gift for you. I hear the invoices at the top. Luckily, David didn't fall for it, but he worries about others who might feel intimidated by such an official-looking bill. Knock it off. They're trying to scam people. So the next time you get a magazine in the mail that you didn't order, consider it a gift. You can read it or just... Throw it away, but whatever you do, don't feel compelled to pay for it. I'm Angie Moreski. It pays to be consumer wise. Half of the Indiana children who died of abuse or neglect in some 50 cases we reviewed involved families with prior history with Child Protective Services. Children like two-year-old Brianna Noe. Always had a big smile on her face whenever we were with her. Brianna's father, Brad May, says he repeatedly warned CPS his daughter was in danger. While caseworkers did investigate, the state chose not to remove Brianna from her mother's care, attributing the father's allegations to a custody dispute. I told everybody, everybody that would listen that she was going to hurt my daughter. And it happened. Brianna was drowned by her mother in Fort Wayne this summer. Judy Noe told police she wrapped Brianna in a shower curtain and held her under the shower water 
until her eyes rolled back in her head. She then kept the toddler's decomposing body in her apartment with her other children for more than two weeks. In many other cases we reviewed, which also note prior contact, the state refuses to release reports detailing the history. The high-profile case of four-year-old Diamond Edmonds in Indianapolis is one example. Diamond was beaten to death by her mother and her mother's boyfriend, whipped with a belt and switch over two days for drinking out of someone else's cup. Why did you beat your child like that? Part of the answer could be in her CPS file. Prior history is often a major indicator of future abuse. But in the file provided, there are conflicting reports. It says no prior history, but then it says there's investigation under prior history, so we're not sure what to think. We asked top officials at the Division of Family and Children about the discrepancy. I don't blame you. That's, that's very confusing. The state later told us there was a history, but they would release no further information because it was not directly related to Diamond's death. So you don't think it's part of the statute to release the past history? I do not, and that's, what, that's the advice of counsel. The Family and Social Services Administration takes the position it's up to them to decide what CPS history should or should not be released. But that's a job the legislators who wrote the law say they specifically assigned to judges to avoid a conflict of interest. Do you think FSSA should be turning over the files on the prior history? Absolutely. It, it is part of the relevancy. It establishes, it establishes a pattern. It, it, shows if, in fact, mistakes were made previously and if they were constantly repeated. If uh, FSSA is not turning that information over, they are violating the law. Yes, it violates the whole purpose of keeping the, the sorting to an independent, detached judge. Turn over the entire record. We shared with agency leaders, joined by their attorney, what the legislators had to say, but they stood by their position. The language is very specific as to what we what is included and it is just is simply the information surrounding the death. That's your interpretation. They're saying that it does mean past history. Doesn't the intent matter? When it comes to the past history that contributes to the death that we are investigating, that information is indeed included. But that's the judge's job to redact the information that he does not consider relevant, not FSSA's job. Well, our job is to inter is to apply the law as our legal counsel interprets it, and that is exactly what we are doing. But those trying to fix a troubled system say this is an example of how those in the system are resisting change. It's not a finger-pointing process, but it's an educational process that we can all work together to correct those shortcomings within the system and hopefully prevent any future children from being killed. Now, you may have noticed some of the documents that we showed you had large portions blacked out like this. That's another issue we encountered. The law allows judges to remove information they believe is not relevant to the child's death. Some decided to leave all the information, while others blacked out large portions, including the name of the victim, the perpetrator, even information in newspaper articles already public that are included in the file. So, John, despite this new law that's designed to open these records up to public scrutiny, there's still a lot we're being kept from finding. Out. And it sounds like the legislature will take up this issue again in the coming session. They are absolutely looking at whether they need to make more changes to get these records opened up even further. In the world of pharmaceutical sales, the Lidoderm patch shines as a breakout performer. It's responsible for taking Endo Pharmaceuticals from a scrappy startup to a high-flying growth company in just six years. Trying to see Dr. Howard? All the way, Endo executives pushed and praised their sales force. We've hit an all-time high with Lidoderm at over 54,500 scripts. Today on that marketplace of Lidoderm. Lidoderm had an all-time high number of total prescriptions. Driving Lidoderm. Great job, team. To unparalleled success. More than $750 million in sales for 2010. But it's an unlikely position for a drug approved only to treat a very small group of patients. They gained the system from the beginning. It's cheating taxpayers out of a lot of money. Peggy Ryan has been a top salesperson at Endo for the past decade. She came forward as a whistleblower nearly seven years ago after becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the company's pressure for her to sell Lidoderm off-label for unapproved uses, something the company knows is illegal. Ever since I began in April of 2002, 
there was uh, much pressure to promote the lidoderm patch off-label. The lidoderm patch is only approved by the FDA to treat post-herpetic neuralgia, PHN, a painful skin rash which is a complication of shingles. It affects mostly the elderly and has a very narrow market. By Endo's own account, no more than 200,000 new patients a year. Part of the master scheme is that the lidoderm patch is covered under orphan status. Orphan status is an incentive the government gives to drug companies to produce products that treat rare diseases like PHN that affect small patient populations. In exchange, companies get tax incentives, a long patent life with no competition, and faster, easier FDA approval. All this to encourage a company to produce a drug with little profit potential. But as it turns out, Endo made billions on Lytoderm by breaking the rules. Every taxpayer, every person in this country that pays taxes was harmed as a result of this activity. It was just a, a lot of greed, and it continues to be a lot of greed. They were breaking the law. Very much part of the culture to sell off-label with Endo. It wasn't inadvertent, it wasn't an accident, they meant to do it.